Genesis 17, 7 through 9, these are the words of the Lord. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations as an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after, after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Deuteronomy 7, know therefore that the Lord, your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Psalm 105, he remembers his covenant forever the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Jeremiah 1, 15, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Galatians 1, 15, but when he who set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace. Psalm 22, Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. And thank you for the promises that are ours in and through Christ Jesus. Father, I pray above all things that the best thing that your people hear this hour are the words that your servant has read. Father, I pray that you will draw near to us and speak a word to all of us in this room. Would you be pleased to use your servant for your glory, for your honor, for your fame. In Jesus' name, amen. The reason I read a list of passages is because as I was praying this week about being with you all, one of the most important rules about preaching and teaching is to know your audience. And I didn't know who would be here and I didn't know where you'd sit. But thinking broadly, there are four people in this room that, that need a word from the Lord. One is Elizabeth. What is God saying to us in the room about her? Two, it's a grieving family. She was carried in your womb. She was conceived in your marriage. She was placed into your family unit. And so you all carry this grief in a way that some of us don't. And the Lord has a word for you. And then there are others in the room. We're friends and church members and co-workers. And we know the Lord. And we might be wrestling, well, what is it for me? What is the Lord calling me to do in this season where my brother and sisters are walking in the valley of the shadow of death? And then there are those of you in the room who don't know Jesus. And I've talked to two in Caroline, and what they want more than anything is for you to know their Savior. And so there are four audiences in the room, and I'll start with the first. What does Jesus say about little Elizabeth? Her body is in front of us. And I was the first one here after her body was brought out just to have some time, and it is sad. It is sad not getting to see her grow up. It's sad seeing a casket in front of us. And I want to acknowledge her value and her dignity and her beauty, and it's not measured in her time on earth. It's measured in the fact that she was made in the image of God Almighty. 
What might Jesus say to us about her? The Lord knows our days, even when we did not. The Lord has been working in utero thousands of years before we even develop sonograms. Jeremiah 1, before I formed you in the womb, says the Lord, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. Paul says in Galatians, but when he who set me apart before I came out of the womb and he called me by his grace, David in Psalm 22, you are the one who took me from the womb and you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Luke chapter 1, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with joy. Do you see what the Bible is saying? God doesn't need a child to be born to call them to himself. God has saving grace that he is pleased to give out before kids can breathe. And that's a comfort. We also know that the Lord loves believers and he loves our children. We can't divorce covenant theology from the cross of Christ. This is why God told Abraham, my covenant is not just for you. It is for you and your offspring and your children after you to 1,000 generations. This is why Deuteronomy tells us the Lord is your God. He is faithful. He keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Psalm 105, he remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. And yes, it is true. David would write, you took me from my mother's womb and you made me trust you. But he would also write, in sin did my mother conceive me. And so how do you reconcile the tension? The tension of David saying, I've been a sinner from birth, and when I was in the womb, you took me. How do you reconcile that? You reconcile that because God's grace triumphs over man's sin. And when we extrapolate, extrapolation is taking known data points that we know and then looking at that pattern and running that pattern along that same line because we know these fixed data points, what the Father is saying to us about her is know the data points. Know that I set children apart for my glory and for my good. Know that I call them to myself before they do anything outside of the womb. Know that I love covenant parents and covenant children, and you take that and you extrapolate from that. This is why our Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 10, verse 3, listen to this. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated and saved by Christ through the Spirit who works when and where and how he pleases. So also are all other elect persons who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word. You you hear that? Let me give you my translation of that. The ministry of the word is God's normal means of rescuing sinners. But God is not normal. And he is not bound to predictability. People are born with severe mental and physical challenges, and God will rescue his elect, and not one of them will be lost. Nothing will keep him from them. He does what he pleases, for whom he pleases, how he pleases, for his own good pleasure. Take comfort in those words. But what does Jesus say to you? and Caroline and Ella and Cameron. I will not pretend to know what it's like to bury a child. 
I once read that society has a word for a spouse who loses their spouse. We call them widows. We have a word for a child who loses their parents. We call them orphans. We do not have a word for a parent who loses a child. And this is what you feel in the moment. A loss of words, confusion, grief, and heartache. There's a scene in Marvel's Wanda Vision where Wanda and the Vision, and the Vision is an android. He's a, a robot with human like programming, and they're about to part ways. And he tells Wanda, I've always been alone, so I don't feel lack. It's all I've ever known. And I've never experienced loss because I've never had a loved one to lose. But what is grief if not love persevering? That android is more human than we think. He's on to something. The grief that you feel over Elizabeth's death is love. It is love persevering. It is love continuing on. It is evidence that she mattered, that she changed you, that you adored her. And while the world may not have a word for where you are, God does. He looks at you both and says, I know. I know what it's like to lose a son. I know what it's like to lose my firstborn. I know what it's like to have him come to this world and be broken and not survive it. I know what it's like to watch his heart stop beating and his lungs stop breathing. I know what it's like to hear him say, Daddy, I'm thirsty. And I know what it's like to watch him die. C.S. Lewis says, friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have some common insight or interest. Each believe it to be his own unique treasure or burden. The typical expression of opening friendship will be something like, what, you two? I thought I was the only one. And God comes to you today he says, you too, we both have lost a child. Let's journey down this road as intimate friends forever. The God of all comfort will do it, but he is more than the God of all comfort. He will turn your weeping into dancing, your mourning into marvel, and your grief into gladness. You know these light and momentary afflictions because of Jesus are preparing for you an eternal weight of glory. You know that our tents that we are in right now are groaning and they're longing to put on what is permanent and eternal. And you know King Jesus, he's called Elizabeth to get her permanent residence. She beat you to the finish line. And one day, you'll see her again. As David said about his son that he lost, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. Take comfort in your God and your king. What about other family and friends, other believers? If you're here today, you love them. And maybe you're wondering, what do I do? I don't want things to be awkward. I don't want to overstep. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't know what they need. The Bible invites you and I to bear one another's burdens. Grief, like our sanctification, is a community project. And so what can you do? You can pray. We're told that the prayers of the righteous are effective and they're powerful. Elijah prayed that there'd not be rain and there was no rain. 
Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still and the moon to not appear, and it happened. These are in the Bible so that God's people will enter God's throne with boldness and pray. And so pray for comfort for them. Pray that the enemy does not drive a wedge in their marriage, which often happens. They're one flesh, but they're two different people. And they grieve differently. And so you pray, and you pray hard, that her death does not drive a wedge in their marriage. Pray boldly that their children will grieve with hope. Pray boldly that God gets glory in her passing. Listen and be curious. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them what they need. Ask them what passages have been sources of comfort. Show up. Your presence, your hugs, your gestures of kindness, they matter. I've already heard about somebody sending cookies from somewhere, and me and my wife took two of them, and they were awesome. I've heard about people who just showed up to see two, and he wasn't there, and Caroline deeply needed some company, and you blessed her when you showed up. Some of you have taken photographs, and you've written personal letters that they keep going back to to anchor them. This is why David says in Psalm 16, the saints of the land are the excellent ones in whom is all of my delight. May that be their testimony in times of sorrow that the saints are our delight. And here's the the fourth thing, keep showing up. Once the day is over and Elizabeth is laid to rest, the cards and the calls will slowly begin to decrease. We will go on with our lives, but this new life without her will just be beginning for them. If you are in their inner circle of friends, stay there and keep inviting them to the circle. If you're knit to them in other ways, put them on your prayer list, maybe every Friday. Get your phones out and put reminders in your phones to reach out. Time and distance will make you forget that they're grieving. Keep showing up. Last thing, what is Jesus' words to unbelievers? The Bible is a strange book. It's a beautiful book, a glorious book, but it says something like this. Better It is to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting, for the living discern that this is their end, and they lay these things to heart. The Bible is actually saying it's better to be at a funeral than a feast, a gravesite than a game, a morgue than a ski trip on a mountain with all of your friends. Now, why? Why does the Bible say it's better for you to be right here than anywhere else your mind might be trying to escape to right now? It's because we numb the reality of our own deaths with fun and with excitement and with cool trips. And all of the time we're doing that, we're not thinking about the fact that we're perishing And so we presume that we will always be healthy, that death is not coming, that it is so far away from us that we don't have to think about it. And then when you see a casket, something happens, something gets you to the core of your soul and it preaches to you that you are mortal. And this is why one author says in 100 years, all new people in 100 years, no one in this room will be alive. Maybe. The Bible says it's appointed for everyone to live and then to die. Why? 
the world will say, this is just how things are. That's not true. It's just a part of living. That's not true. Death entered the world through sin, the sin of our first parents. And death spread to all because all sin and the wages of sin is death. And every single death we encounter validates the truthfulness of God's word. But the same God who says that the wages of sin is death also says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The story of the Bible is this. God would not sit back and do nothing. He, from the beginning, had a plan to send someone to deal with sin and to deal with death. And the someone is the Son of God, very God of very God, and his name is Jesus. And we believe that the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and was found in human likeness. And because he was God, he could obey God's law like no mere human could. And he was rewarded with death. Why? Not for his sins, but for ours. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. We all like sheep go astray, each of us in our own ways. And your sin of choice, your sin patterns may be lust. And it may be pride, and it may be racism, and it may be envy, and it may be workaholism, it may be alcoholism, it may be idolatry and anger and malice and not keeping Sabbath and not honoring parents and murdering people with your words and your actions and lying and stealing. But what the Bible says is that we all go astray like sheep and each of us in our own ways. But God has done something profound. He has taken our iniquity and the just judgment due us and he has laid them on on Jesus that if you trust in him you never die his casket is a door into glory if you trust in him and what Caroline and two want you to know if you're here and you don't need Jesus and you don't know Jesus there is one who looks at them and loves them more than they love her And they will make it through the valley of the shadow of death because he is with them. They want you to know their Savior. Will you bow the knee? And will you trust in the King of glory? And you don't have to walk down the aisle. You can do it right there. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will apply your word to your people. Thank you for your steadfast love towards our children and their children to a thousand generations. Thank you for being the God of comfort who knows what it's like to lose, but also being the God of all power and glory who are making all things new. Thank you, Lord, that our hearts have been knit to this family through Christ, that there is no slave, nor free, nor male, nor female, nor black, nor white. We are one in Christ, and we are one family called to love and serve and be with them in their time of need. Give us grace to do that. And Father, for those who don't know you, use your word to draw them to yourself through the life and death of this little precious girl but more importantly, the life and death 